I want to welcome everybody. We have about 15 people online and suspect we'll have a few more joining. Uh, let, let me introduce myself. I'm David Miller. I'm the director of the Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust. We're the land trust in Rangeley. Have about 14,000 acres uh, under our purview. And thrilled today to have uh, two of the leading trout experts, uh, certainly in the state of Maine, if not beyond. I, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, uh, Charles Govin, in one second. Uh, thanks, David. We have four basic areas that we want to hit. Um, Forrest is going to, Forrest Bonnie is going to talk about profiling the Rangeley region brook trout as a nationally important uh, fish species or fish resource um, and an umbrella species for the health of watersheds. Generally, um, we want to tease out and understand why Rangeley brook trout are so special. Um, and then we want to, uh, we'll shift to Jeff Reardon, who's going to talk about climate change impacts on brook trout habitat. Um, the bad news is that climate change will have a dramatic impact potentially on brook trout. The good news is that Rangeley is one of the most res resilient areas of the state um, and the future for Rangeley region brook trout is probably not as dire as it is for some other places. And then we want to talk a little bit about um, some strategies for mitigating climate impacts um, on brook trout, um, especially strategies that relate to uh, land conservation, which is really what the Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust is all about. Um, I want to start by thanking those of you who are members of our Haida Land Society and um, and welcoming everybody else. We have a great mix of people for this uh, presentation and discussion. And um, I got to say, personally, for me, um, this is a great honor because I've been a Rangeley area brook trout fisherman for over 60 years. And um, uh, to me, this is really kind of a brook trout Valhalla. Um, and the nice thing about it is, um, Back in the day when I ran Trout Unlimited, I used to get comments from people like, oh, Maine, that was good fishing 100 years ago. Well, actually, in some respects, the fishing in the Range of the Lakes region and uh, brook trout fishing in Maine is, thanks to people like Jeff Reardon and Forrest Bonney, better than it was certainly 30 years ago. Um, and we think we understand what we would need to do to make it as good as it was maybe 100 years ago. So we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, we're very interested in making Rangeley region brook trout great again. So with that, I'm Forrest. Uh, thank you. And, uh, and before I get started, I want to thank Charles for involving me in this project. One of the highlights of my career was working in the Rangeley region with the uh, guides and uh, with the trust and with Trout Unlimited surveying streams and, and implementing uh, uh, stream restoration projects, and these were all for, for brook trout. Uh, the brook trout are indeed sensitive uh, species. Uh, technically, they're not a trout, they're a char. And I mention this because they are in a genus, including the, uh, well, the, uh, the lake trout and the blueback trout and the uh, uh, other species that, that evolved in, in northern uh, regions and cold water with, uh, uh, with lots of oxygen in it. So if you have brook trout, that means you have good habitat because that's the only place uh, that they can live. And, uh, and originally, at least, they were native to uh, all waters of, of Maine and uh, they still pretty much are, although as you get down toward the coastal plain and the Penobscot plain, they tend to be supported by stocking due to uh, habitat degradation and competition from other species. But, but still, we have a, a wonderful population, uh, especially when you go inland. And uh, now we have range-wide data available from a, uh, from a project I'll, I'll talk about it in just a bit that, that will help us show what we have in relation to the other uh, states. Next slide, please, David. Yep. Uh, as Charles mentioned, Rangeley has a fabled uh, history and, uh, 
if the uh, if the participants are familiar with Rangeley, they're familiar with that history. Uh, originally, there were no salmon up there. There were salmon in the state, but not in the Rangeleys. The, there were no smelt, which, which provided a, a forage for, for the salmon. Um, and the uh, the huge brook trout then relied upon blueback trout as forage. Uh, blueback trout were much smaller. Uh, they ran into the tributaries of the big lakes in the fall to spawn, and when they did, uh, they were caught by the barrel, salted, and shipped to the Boston market. Over time, that plus overfishing uh, changed the fishery a great deal, as well as the introduction of other species, fish species. Um, in the 1850s, there were dams built, which had an impact on the movement uh, of, the, of the lake uh, uh, fish populations. Sporting camps were developed with uh, uh, way too liberal uh, bank limits and the uh, species were overfished in, in many of the waters. Uh, however, uh, there are also some historical figures that, that, that developed during this time, Fly Rod Crosby and Terry Stevens and Herbie Welsh and, and others. So it was, it was kind of a mixed bag. And especially after the, uh, uh, after the railway came through in the 1890s, uh, there was a lot more use and a lot more harvest, uh, even in the outlying waters. Next slide. And so we have this dichotomy of the, uh, what, was, what was there in the old days with what we face now. Uh, the largest trout caught in the old days was 12 and a half pounds from Muslik Bagunik Lake. We haven't gotten point back to that point yet, but we are getting back uh, through a couple of large changes. And uh, number one is the more stringent regulations. Number two is the change in anglers' attitude toward harvest uh, and, and, and the development of the uh, catch and release ethic. And, and for the waters that are stocked, we as fishers biologists uh, really had to cut back on our stocking in, in those waters. And those where there were wild fish, we had to cut back in, in our regulations in, in some cases, uh, due to the fact that, that fishermen were, were releasing so many more fish, which is a wonderful thing. Next slide. Um, so, Maine is the last stronghold of, of wild and native brook trout in, in the eastern U.S. And, and I'll, I'll show you some supporting data in just a moment. And where that data came from for the region-wide assessment, if, uh, that little box in the bottom, the joint venture, the eastern brook trout joint venture was developed in, I think, 2006 as a cooperative effort, effort between uh, government agencies, NGOs such as Trout Unlimited, uh, state agencies, and anybody who was interested in, in brook trout. And uh, there was a, uh, uh, the, the federal biologist kind of pulled the data together, uh, the data that, that we all, all provided, and showed where the uh, brook trout are thriving and where they're not, where the wild and native brook trout are thriving and where they're not. And, and some of the uh, uh, other facts that came out of the study is that uh, as many intact uh, watersheds in Maine as in all the other states combined. And I should uh, stop here a moment to define how they did the analysis. Uh, there wasn't enough data in a lot of cases to, to uh, provide information on every single water body, especially the streams and rivers. So it was done by a, a sub-watershed uh, basis. And uh, for an example, the Androscoggin would be a watershed, a sub-watershed would be uh, the Kennebago or the Cupsuptic or the Megalloway. And, uh, and the bottom line here, 90% of the remaining wild and native lake and pond brook trout populations are in Maine. Their population is south of us, but they are not wild, they're stocked. Next uh, slide, please. And here it is in map form. This tells the story. Green is go, red is stop, and uh, gray is, is forget about it. Uh, once you get south of Maine, uh, you see a lot of red. 
in the uh, in the eastern range, actually 21% of the habitat that, that they've been extirpated. But in the, in Maine, uh, these uh, these subwatersheds, more than a half of them are intact, which means that uh, uh, we we didn't have uh, information for every single water body, but we have it for a lot of particular water bodies, and and we assumed that uh, if the uh, if the surrounding area was good for for book trout, then uh, then we could say that that the uh, most of the northern Maine is intact, the habitat is intact and and suitable. It, and it's only when you get toward the southern area and the coastal plain that uh, that it falls off. Next slide. So, zooming into Maine. This is where the uh, Primo uh, Lake and Pond fisheries are. The uh, native populations have never been stocked to the best of our knowledge. And uh, the wild ones have been stocked, but not within the last 25 years. So they've uh, they developed their own genome and, and they've essentially become wild fish, if not, even though they're not native fish. And the uh, lion's share of them are in the inland uh, areas along the mountainous uh, west part of the state and up into the northern latitudes uh, with a few in, over in Hancock County where you have the higher elevations there. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, one that Charles put together and he makes a very good point that uh, some of the uh, other of the wonderful populations of, uh, uh, of wild trout. Uh, a lot of them are out west, but uh, and, and here's an example of Yellowstone Lake with the uh, with the Yellowstone uh, cutthroat. But uh, uh, Charles mentioned that these two maps are on the same scale. So uh, if you look at Maine, uh, we fare favorably with those western populations. Next slide. So, as I've mentioned, uh, and, and as you know, the brook trout are a really cold water fish, and not a warm water fish or in between. The, the, uh, they need cold, well oxygenated water. They need gravel and springs to, uh, uh, to reproduce in. Uh, Groundwater in Maine is pretty much 50 degrees year round, so if they lay the rigs in the gravel and springs over winter, it doesn't freeze and, and it also provides oxygen for them. And we, we have a lot of waters with that, and especially in the streams. Um, brook trout don't compete well. Uh, we need waters where warm water fish haven't been introduced. And uh, it also helps to have large patches of connected habitat because we don't want inbred populations. We want them to be able to travel throughout the drainage uh, to uh, maintain their genetic diversity. And Rangeley, we have all of those and uh, <clears throat> habitat conditions. And, and we also have a very good system of uh, major rivers connected to major lakes so that they can travel back and forth throughout the year to meet those uh, uh, different habitat requirements. And I'll show you an example of that as I finish up here. Next slide. Uh, some studies were done in the Rangeleys in connection with the uh, relicensing of the hydropower dam. And uh, they were done by Inland Fish and Wildlife in conjunction with other stakeholders, Trout Unlimited, F Florida Power and Light, uh, the owners of the dam, and uh, the telemetry involved the insertion of these units within large fish so that they could be tracked. They were surgically implanted and sutured in, in, in the uh, gut, in the abdominal cavity, and, uh, and monitored throughout the season. And uh, if I can have the next slide, I'll show you, uh, uh, this is in the Rapid River in particular, from uh, Middle Dam down to Umbagog. And what, what these uh, studies showed that uh, in the cold water period from April until the water uh, became too warm in early July, the adults had the run of the river. 
uh, they could move up and down pretty much at, at will. But as it got warmer, next slide, Uh, it, it doesn't show pond in the river real well, but it is there. Uh, then they moved out of the river and they moved into th these uh, thermal refuges, uh, which are springs in the deep water and pond in the river. There were three springs and uh, depending on the size of the springs, they, uh, it varied w with the use of these adult fish. And so they could meet what, uh, what habitat restrictions occurred and in the river, due to warm temperatures, they could avoid that by going into the lake, essentially. And, and, and that occurs throughout the uh, lakes of the drainage. Uh, next slide. Now, the fry, the, the little guys, the little trout, uh, couldn't migrate those distances, but they didn't need to. They lived in, uh, between the rocks and in the rapid river, uh, and they fed on, on plankton and insects and that sort of thing. But when the water became too warm, uh, the, the, first I should mention that they were assessed by electrofishing uh, because obviously they're too little to have tags put in them, uh, which takes a lot of effort. And in this slide, uh, it shows Dave Howard of the Inland Fisheries and, and Kyle Murphy of, of Florida Power and Light working, uh, working together uh, to get this data. Next slide. So this is what the fry did when the waters warmed up too high them, for them. And, and this is indeed, this is what they do in, in all of our rivers around here. They, they seek out these little seeps, these little pools, and they don't have to be as uh, very big because the fish aren't very big. So they were able to meet their, uh, their temperature requirements and oxygen requirements uh, throughout the season. So, uh, so the point is that this, uh, the Rangeleys provide a, uh, uh, habitat similar to this in all of our lakes and, and river systems. So it, uh, uh, even with the warmer temperature in the streams, they're, they're well able to survive the, uh, through the year. And with that, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Jeff. Great, you wanna give me the next slide, David? And uh, just to start off, uh, I just wanna say how much I appreciate being able to do this presentation with Charles, who, uh, who when I was still a high school teacher, uh, decided he'd offer me a job at Trout Unlimited and uh, Forrest, who really got me interested in, in fisheries work back when I was a TU volunteer and, and he was running the, the strong office with working on some of the studies that we're talking about here uh, when we were working on the licensing of, of Middle Dam. Um, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure 20 years later to be back with the two of them. Um, so what I want to talk about is climate change and what we can expect that's going to do uh, to brook trout in general, to brook trout here in Maine, um, and, and uh, what we might expect for changes in the Rangeley region, which I think is, as, as Charles hinted at, going to be a little bit more resilient than other parts of the state. We'll talk about why. But the, the big thing is, um, you know, climate change is, is already happening. Um, the, depending on what sources you want to believe. I, th I think in the slides here, I'm mostly citing from either um, the University of Maine does periodic climate reports on what's happening here in the state of Maine. And um, uh, NOAA puts out a national, or multiple federal agencies uh, periodically put out a national climate assessment. And um, as of five years ago, which I think is when I first pulled these slides together, um, both of them were saying that we had seen something like a two degree Fahrenheit increase in average annual temperature comparing, um, you know, 2015, say, to 19 or to, to 1900, so in a little over a century. Uh, we'd seen a little over a five inch increase in annual precipitation here in Maine. Um, but and, and Maine's a pretty wet state, so that five inches isn't all that significant. Uh, but a huge increase, 70% uh, increase in the amount of that annual precipitation that comes in extreme events. So what that means is while it may be wetter on average, what we'll see is extended wet periods when it's really wet and extended dry periods like we saw this year in June when we just don't see any rain for three, four, five weeks at a time, which, which did not used to be normal in Maine. And a big shift that I think really matters for drought uh, and anything else that depends on cold water is that we're seeing ice out uh, again, this slide's a little dated. This says nine days earlier. I believe now they're talking about that shift being about 12 days earlier. Um, they've, they've since done an update. Um, and what that means is as soon as the ice goes off our ponds in the spring, 
the water temperature starts warming up because the days are long, the sun is out, the air is warmer than the water. And if you think about ice out happening, say nine to you know a, a week and a half to two weeks earlier, uh, ice out in is probably similarly later in the fall, which means the ice free period is longer. And so the period of time the water is exposed to the air and the sun and warm air temperatures to get warmer gets longer. And so the stressful period, Forrest showed you what uh, back in the 1990s brook trout were doing in the Rapid River, the period of time those fish need to move and find those cold water thermal refuges goes from being a matter of, you know, four, five, six weeks in July and August to maybe seven or eight weeks as the ice out, ice freeze season gets a little bit longer. Next slide. So what do we expect going forward? And these, these are projections again from the National Climate Assessment. Um, you know, if we've seen so far, when we, we're seeing some changes on the ground from the two degrees of warming we've already experienced, uh, depending on the uh, climate scenario you look at, you know, how aggressive do we get about controlling emissions? Uh, what can we do for adaptation? Uh, in some cases, what's the level of uncertainty in the various models about what might happen with different levels of carbon in the atmosphere? Uh, so there's a range of outcomes here, but they, we expect you know, within the next uh, 60 years to see an additional warming of three to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, um, a, a large increase in the number of days that are over 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, to the point that the, the coast of Maine is projected by 2080 to have a climate like what the coast of New Jersey had in the 1990s. And I'll just say, as a kid who grew up in Maine and had his first job after college in Newark, New Jersey, uh, that is not a climate that things that are native to Maine enjoy very much. It's, it's, it's a different world. It's a matter of a day or two above 90 to maybe a dozen days above 90. And it really is gonna make a difference for water temperature and anything that requires cold, cold water. Uh, and we see these increases in extreme precipitation events, which I think is the next slide. Um, and and the, certainly the models suggest and the data uh, confirm that with, with uh, increasing warming, we will see more of our precipitation come in these extreme events. And uh, this is a slide of, uh, there was an event in July of 2018 that some of you may have been in the Rangeley area for. Uh, there was something uh, on the order of six inches of rain in a very intense thunderstorm that seemed to hit some tributaries of the Kennebago River extremely hard. And literally uh, one, one very small tributary just came completely unzipped. Uh, there are places where that stream cut itself three, four, five feet down into glacial till from where the stream bed had been forever. And it's, it's not uncommon to see a big rain event cause some erosion and pretend and some changes in the physical structure of the stream. But I was on this site with, with two geomorphologists from the University of Massachusetts and, um, and one from Boston College, and they both said they'd never seen anything like it in their careers. These are people who study what big rain events do to rivers and lakes. Um, this sedimentation event that occurred in this was large enough that these folks who are doing a long-term study on sediments in Ken Little Kennebago Lake could detect that event the next year and see the deposition of sediment from that storm event that showed up as a, as a layer. It's sort of like tree rings uh, in the sediment on the bottom of the stream. Um, there was a very similar event that hit the Spencer Pond, um, Parlin Lake area up near between Jackman and the Forks. Uh, that event was 12 inches and hit uh, in particular um, some tributaries to Parlin Lake pretty hard and literally just took out an entire road that was about four miles long. Uh, we do not have infrastructure and, and uh, you know, forest management practices, best management practices. They're designed for the climate we've had historically. And so when events like this happen, culverts blow out, uh, the kinds of best management practices you put in site in, in place on a tree harvesting site simply aren't, aren't adequate to deal with those kinds of really intense rain events because Historically, that those didn't occur, so we haven't planned for them. Next. So what are the changes that matter for brook trout? I think I've mostly talked about these, but as the air temperature gets warmer, the water temperature follows it. Uh, water, water takes longer to heat up than the air does, um, so it doesn't rise quite as fast. But as you get extended warm periods, you will see the water temperature increasing a half a degree or a degree per warm day. 
uh, the warmer the days, and in particular, the warmer the nights are. You get hot days and cool nights, uh, the things will cool back down during the nighttime. But when you get those periods where it's in the 80s or 90s during the daytime and above 70 at night, really the water temperature just goes up and up and up on a ramp. Uh, you, you can see it come up each day. A couple, there are some questions in the various models of how increased air temperature affects water temperature. Um, groundwater, Forrest talked about this a lot. Maine is a, a state very rich in groundwater. There's a reason Poland Spring uh, was founded where they were and still gets a lot of their water here. Uh, we have a lot of groundwater in the state uh, that will, um, where there are groundwater dominated systems, that are much less susceptible to these air temperature impacts. Uh, and the access to thermally stratified lakes, like all the lakes in the Rangeley region, uh, may reduce those water temperature impacts, both by giving fish refuge areas and by providing some cold reservoirs that may buffer the systems from the warming you see in you know, bigger, shallower lakes. You'll see more change in a lake like Umbagog uh, in, in the future than you're gonna see in a lake like Rangeley or Muslim McGonick or Richardson. Earlier ice outs mean a longer period of thermal stress in the summer. The summer gets longer, the winter gets shorter, the fish are stressed for you know a period of a longer period. It's probably you know four to six weeks, depending on the summer. Now it may be two months or longer in the future. Um, as precipitation patterns change, do we see changes to groundwater? Um, do we see changes to physical habitat? And I think the answer is yes, but exactly what they're going to be is is hard to predict. But we're already seeing the, some of the changes to physical habitat those rain events have have caused. And uh, you know we're seeing these extended summer droughts where we see record low groundwater levels now too. As things get warmer, um, many of the things that we know are already challenging our brook trout, in particular non-native species. Um, the, the things become more favorable for them, less favorable for brook trout. Uh, there's some pretty good work on on smallmouth bass in far northern Maine that they, although they've been introduced in places, um, they've not really taken off because the summers are just a little bit too cold for them to thrive. A couple of degrees warmer water temperature and that balance shifts and it's in the bass's favor, not the brook trout's favor. There are also a number of forest pests we're gonna see. Hemlock woolly adelgid will take out hemlock trees, which particularly to our south, um, provide a lot of the shade that keeps brook trout streams cooler. Um, but emerald ash borer is in Maine now. Uh, any of you who live down in, in anywhere uh, along the coast and now in my region of the state, I live near Augusta, uh, brown tail moth is taking out oak trees like uh, like like you wouldn't believe, and we're all walking around with poison ivy all summer. And it, those those uh, those changes in the insect community will will result in changes in the forest community, and that will have results for the streams that flow through those forests. Next slide. Uh, climate change will also add to the existing stressors. Uh, Forrest talked about the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, which, which looked at the status of brook trout. It also looked, again, this is range-wide, what were the primary threats to brook trout? Uh, here are the top 10 ranked in order uh, based on which watersheds they affected, and, and I've circled in red or, or put red boxes around those that climate change will make worse than they are today. Non-native fish we talked about, water temperature we talked about, stream fragmentation and roads, um, uh, those culverts that are impassable under either very high flows or very low flows now uh, become impassable much more frequently as we see more extreme high flows and more extreme low flows in between them. Um, next. So how much habitat loss should we expect to see? And if you look in the, in the literature at what's been published, there are lots of estimates uh, the earliest I know of came from the EPA back in 1995, and they predicted, I think they were looking out to 2100, that we might see a 50 to 99% reduction in cold water fish habitat nationwide uh, in that period of you know roughly 100 years from when they were doing the study. Their study was based on water temperature changes and looking at rainbow trout and brown trout. So brook trout are a little more sensitive to temperature change than um, than, than uh, brown trout and rainbow trout. And they weren't really looking at some of the things like thermal refuges, stratified cold lakes that will provide some, some, uh, uh, some um, buffering to those impacts. There's a much more comprehensive, basically a modeling study um, uh, done by a, a, a group. I can give the reference if anybody wants it, uh, published in 2013, 
they were looking at brown trout with a thermal tolerance of about 24 degrees Celsius. Uh, brook trout are a little more, uh, brook trout I think porous would probably agree with me, we'd be, we'd be looking more like 22 degrees Celsius as their upper limit. Um, but what they predicted was that if you looked at what you projected for water temperature changes by 2030, you'd see about a 5% conversion of existing cold water habitat being converted to warm water habitat. Now remember this study seven years ago and they were looking out to 10 years in the future. Their, their predictions did not show any change in that time frame here in Maine. If you went out to 2050, another 20 years, nationwide, it's a 25% conversion from cold water to warm water habitat. And we start seeing losses, particularly in Northern and Eastern Maine. Uh, Western Maine and Southern Maine for different reasons. Uh, Western Maine because of higher elevations. Southern Maine because there's a lot of groundwater influence down there. Don't see as, as, as great losses. But uh, like Arista County, it looks like climate change could be a slate wiper up there. Those streams are lower elevation, warmer, and you may see things like the whole Allagash watershed maybe not supporting brook trout under, under this projection. And then if you look out to 2100, and they, they're showing 60 to 90% of cold water habitat becomes warm water habitat nationwide. And in Maine, only the Western Mountains region, basically from a little south of Rangeley up through Jackman and east to Baxter State Park, uh, the highest elevation part of the state, that's really the only place that their model showed that, that temperatures still remain suitable for brook trout in most of the water today. Now some caveats, they base this strolly on streams uh, like most people, they don't think of trout as lake-dwelling species. Those of us in Maine are, are different. Uh, talk to people who fish other places in the country. Not many of them fish lakes as much as we do here in Maine. Uh, and also, brook trout are probably more sensitive than the brown trout these models were based on. Next. This is just showing those in maps. So um, this is the 2050 scenario. Uh, and what you really want to focus here is the areas that are mapped in green. Those areas mapped in blue are currently cold water habitat and will stay cold water habitat by 2050 under projected, you know, various projected future scenarios. But those that are green are cold water habitat today uh, and are projected to be warm by 2050. And you see most of Maine stays blue with basically the Penobscot Valley and, and the St. John and Allagash Valley showing some losses. Uh, next slide. But if we look out to 2100, and here I'm not showing the whole country because it looks really dire, I'm just showing Maine, and believe it or not, the impacts in Maine are, are significantly less than what many other parts of the country will see because we're farther north, we're close to the ocean, we have some things going for us here. Um, but um, under the most favorable, in other words, we get really, really serious about climate change right away, we cut carbon emissions a lot, um, you know, we follow the IPCC recommendations. So under the coldest scenario, what you see is only the western Maine mountains and a fairly big patch remains cold water habitat in blue. A lot of northern Maine, eastern Maine, southern Maine no longer supports cold water fish. Not too much different under the moderate scenario, but if we're at the hot end of the range, the we do nothing to act for climate change and climate emissions continue to grow at the rate they're growing now, it's really only the Western Maine mountains that keep their brook trout. Um, how much those changes happen really depends on what we do for cutting carbon emissions, what we do for protecting resilient habitat to keep it resilient, and what we do for mitigation and adaptation measures. And I wanna talk a little bit about those in the next couple of slides. So we gotta do what we can about climate change, but we're gonna see some warming under any scenarios. And so what can we do to maximize the chances we keep brook trout as many places as possible? We gotta minimize the other stressors. Uh, you know, the, 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 we, we talk about the death, of, the death of a thousand cuts. You know, brook trout are gonna be more challenged by the climate in intact habitat. Um, those habitats that are impacted by development, by introduction of non-native species, by other human stresses um, are, are gonna be less, less resilient, more susceptible. Uh, maintaining riparian areas is really important, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit in a, in a future slide. Uh, these thermal refuge areas, I think one of the things these models of change probably underestimate is the degree to which brook trout can be kept on the landscape if they can migrate to cold water. So we need to protect those sources of cold water, whether they're deep cold lakes that stratify in the summer or whether they're you know 
high elevation streams that provide cold water all summer. Uh, think about cupsoptic. You know, you can still find fish in August in cupsoptic and not feel guilty about fishing for them. At times, you wouldn't think about fishing many of the other stream habitats in the range of the region because it's higher and colder. Um, you need to protect them. You also need to protect the ability for fish to migrate to those areas, and that that goes to culverts and dams and fish passage. Um, protect large blocks of intact habitat. You know, if if, if uh, those fish are more likely to survive if it's one population in a big watershed where they can move around for the kind of uh, genetic mixing that Forrest talked about. Um, they're going to be more susceptible to blinking out if they're fragmented into five or six small populations that are no longer connected to each other. So we should be thinking big in terms of what we protect for habitat, not in terms of a mile or two or stream. We should be thinking at the watershed level. And we need to reconnect fragmented habitat. I talked about culverts and dams. Maine's really critical to regional conservation. Uh, we're the only state that has these significant lake and pond habitats, which I think are likely to be pretty important for resilience going forward we know our fish already migrate to them. Those slides Forrest showed about all the brook trout from the Rapid River moving below the thermocline and pond in the river, that's really dramatic. And we see that not just there, but just about everywhere people have studied these, these big populations of adult brook trout. Um, we have much less historical loss and fragmentation, which should make our populations more resilient. We're also farther north, closer to the ocean. Uh, we have the Appalachian Spine in Western Maine giving us high elevation and those make us less sensitive than the states to our south and our west. Next. So what do we do to make Maine really great for brook trout again? I, I think we've, we've talked about all these things. Better protection for wild brook trout, um, habitat restoration. Forrest was a real pioneer in this when he was at the department. Uh, there were some really excellent projects that he worked on on South Bog Stream, which is the spawning site for most of the wild brook trout in Rangeley Lake. Uh, there was some work up on the Cupsoptic. I think there was a little bit of work up in Venus. Uh, TU has got a new project uh, working with large wood additions um, and are looking for partners to work with on that. Um, uh, those provide deeper pools that give you some access to groundwater in the in the kind of subsurface flow in the rivers. Uh, they provide overhead cover, um, a little more habitat diversity, a little protection from predators. Um, habitat protection, again, I talked about this and I think, you know, think big, think at the watershed scale. Uh, and think not just about preventing development. Uh, it's not the Rangeley region turning into Portland we need to worry about. It's also the Rangeley world region turning into something that looks um, more like, you know, uh, most of the lakes look like Quimby Pond uh, instead of like the less developed lakes in the region. Um, and uh, land management is really critical. With, with respect to forestry, we, we did some work when, when Charles was still at TU with a, with a consultant that built on some work the state had done for Atlantic salmon and moving from what current timber harvest standards are, whether you do that through regulation or a voluntary measure um, or a purchased easement, there's, there's a lot of ways to do it. But if we could get to 100 feet of no cut adjacent to uh, essentially all of the permanent streams in a watershed, that makes a big difference for brook trout in terms of shade, organic inputs to the stream, large wood inputs to the stream that are important for physical habitat. Um, that, that would be a big change from current practice and it would be one that would have a lot of benefits for brook trout and also lots of other uh, um, species that depend on stream and, and riparian habitats. And those will help build climate resistance and resilience uh, and allow fish to be able to adapt to the rapid environmental change. They need to be able to move and get to places where they can get through those longer, hotter periods we're going to take. And I think there may be one more slide. So brook trout protection, um, invasive exotics. Uh, this is probably the primary threat other than climate change. That includes both sport fish and bait fish. Uh, Maine fairly recently made a change throughout the northern zone. There are some exceptions in waters that have traditionally been open to bait to ice fishing um, and where many of these bait fish species were already introduced, but we went to no live fish as bait as general law for the North Zone. Um, that's been a, a, a goal of ours at Trout Unlimited and, and we've worked with the department for a long time to do that water body by water body. Um, and doing that on a comprehensive scale, I think uh, didn't make much difference in the Rangeley region because most waters up there were already closed to use of live bait fish. But uh, in other parts of the state, that's, that's a huge change in the right direction. 
Um, stocking over native fish, and that includes both stocking non-native species, but also um, stocking of native species. You know, Forrest talked about how as human harvest went down, there became places where the wild fish did a little bit better, and the department had to cut back or even completely eliminate their stocking because the native fish were doing as well as, uh, as, as they needed to. We didn't need to be stocking anymore. Um, keeping um, creel limits and other fishing rules tied to the car carrying capacity. And, and I, am a, I am a proponent of our beginning to think about water temperatures and fishing the same way our colleagues out in the West do. Uh, you go to Montana in August now and you'll have rivers that you can only fish in the morning because they close them in the afternoon as water temperatures get higher. There are some streams out there that they close all together. They monitor water temperatures and close them as water temperatures get too high. Um, and we do have these areas where large numbers of adult brook trout concentrate in midsummer. And where, where those are well known, um, I think those fish take a, a real beating in being you know, repeatedly caught in places where they're concentrated, can't move anywhere to get away, and uh, are in many cases being, being caught repeatedly on, on some of the more heavily fish streams in the region. And next. So stream restoration, this is just a picture. I talked about this before, but I think this is a picture of some of Forrest's work. Is that, is that South Bog Forest? Am I correct on that? It is, yeah. Um, so this is a stream that had probably had logs driven down it, was over widened, shallow, exposed to the sun. Um, and Forrest came in with a, working with a geomorphologist with a design to put in these rock weirs and basically rebuild pools that were probably bulldozed out of, out of the stream, uh, uh, you know, 50 to 100 years ago. Next. And, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, no, I was, I was just going to say that, uh, Jeff, the, um, one of the problems with the problem slide is that a lot of people look at that and say, oh, that's such a pretty little stream. Um, but in fact, it's, it's, it's a stream with, it's very pretty, but it's got serious problems. Yeah, and, and this is a longer conversation, but Forrest did a ton of great survey work on streams across Maine. And basically compared to what we ought to have, uh, I would say that the number one conclusion was we have lost pools that should hold adult brook trout in our smaller streams and, and they're just gone. And that's a result of log drives and bulldozing and you know, other changes on the river that we're not doing anymore, but those streams are probably never going to recover themselves, at least not in human time, maybe in geologic time. Next. So land management adaptations, conserve and enhance riparian habitats. Um, that's not just important for, for trout. 85% uh, of Maine vertebrates use um, riparian habitat during their life cycle. That's from the Maine Climate Change Assessment. Coordinating riparian protection, TU's been talking about this 100-foot no-cut buffer and trying to get that implemented in various places on conservation lands. Um, we could incorporate that with exemplary forestry. Uh, we could incorporate it on state-owned lands like, uh, you know, Maine, Maine Bureau of Parks and Lands land, uh, lands that are owned by um, the Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife as wildlife management areas. Um, and there is some evidence that um, riparian forests store more carbon than upland forests do, which leads to the, the idea that if you're looking for changes in forestry that could store more carbon and have other benefits for riparian habitats and stream habitats, you've got a win-win solution by working on these riparian forests. If, if, if those are the places that you cut less and allow carbon storage to happen, that can be more effective than if you were doing that in, in, on drier soils, a little bit higher in elevation. Next. Uh, so there's multiple benefits of doing that. Uh, you get more shade, you get overhead cover, uh, which trout love. You know, wood is good. Uh, cast your streamer under that big log. There's probably a trout sitting there. Large wood recruitment into the stream channel, which is good for both physical habitat and for energy inputs. You know, things like caddisflies grow on that wood as it decomposes. Lots of wildlife benefits. Uh, my bird friends at Maine Audubon always tell me that I should be asking for much wider buffers than 100 feet which is really kind of where the, the benefits for brook trout max out. But if you want to benefit birds, uh, like wood ducks, for example, will, will nest as far as 100 yards from the water. And so wider buffers may benefit some of the birds that express the species. And then I talked about enhanced carbon storage in riparian areas. There's some research that suggests riparian forests store a lot more carbon than upland forests. Um, 
submerged wood in the stream often doesn't rot. If it stays wet, it, it, it's not susceptible to rotting. And there may be some, some opportunities to enhance carbon storage by uh, just getting more wood in the stream and protecting those riparian areas where carbon storage is higher than in, in drier forests. Next. So TU has a conservation portfolio strategy, and I just want to show you the Rangeley region. Um, this is a little bit complicated, but what, what we look at here is based on existing data on both brook trout populations and various land use parameters, elevation, forest cover, road density, a whole number of parameters. That gets crunched into a model, and, and you look at two, the, you, you can look at that data a number of ways. We can look at it to predict what the future security is for brook trout. You can also look at it to suggest, okay, what's your conservation strategy to keep brook trout on the landscape for the long term? And what you see on the left is that if in the future security range, um, blue here is the highest rated category. Those are the top 20% of habitats throughout the range of brook trout um, for future security. And almost all of the Rangeley region is in that highest security zone. So this is confirming by a different method the study that I cited before that suggests that Western Maine region is some of the cold water habitat in the US that's most resilient to climate change. This is looking at that through a more brook trout specific lens. Shift to the right hand map and what you see in green are areas where essentially brook trout populations now are very healthy. They're considered stronghold populations and you really don't need to do anything. Certainly there are habitat restoration opportunities in there and some degraded habitats. Um, but the best thing we can do for this is to keep it like it is, uh, maybe improve it a little bit. And almost all of the Rangeley region, um, with one exception, is in that secure stronghold category. And the one exception, you'll see there's a, a brown patch in the middle um, that is focused directly on Rangeley Lake. And my guess is that that's just a data artifact because I suspect in the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture data this is based on it does not show Rangeley Lake as wild brook trout habitat, but as many of us who fish it know, it, it, it should be. Essentially, everything that we have in the, in the Rangeley region is in that, it's in good shape, let's keep it that way category, which I think leads to land conservation, the work Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust does as, as really critical. Next. So priority conservation areas, uh, again, anybody who fishes the region will not be surprised by these. Uh, the upper Kennebago, uh, you know, basically from the Tim Pond Road north, uh, the upper Megalloway, uh, including Abbott Brook uh, on the lower Megalloway, but also the Megalloway up above Parmacini and between Parmacini and, and, uh, um, and Aziskahas, South Bog Stream, where Rangeley Lakes Heritage Trust has done a lot of work in part with money that came from that upper dam settlement or upper and middle dam settlement that we worked on together so many years ago. Uh, the Cup Suptic, which is probably the coldest stream in Western Maine, at least the coldest that I know of. Uh, Bemis, which is similar. Small remote ponds that aren't already protected from development, and there are multiple clusters of those in the Rangeley region. And if you think a little bit more broadly, um, if you go up over the divide a little bit, if you look at the headwaters of the Dead, the headwaters of the Sandy, and the headwaters of the Swift, which drain in slightly different directions from the stuff that's going directly into the Androscoggin, um, there are some real opportunities there, although I think I, I think those are probably smaller uh, and more about protecting more isolated headwater habitats that are still in good shape than the opportunity to do things at a big watershed scale we have from uh, basically from uh, uh, Umbagog Lake upstream on all the tributaries. Next. And I think that's it. So we've, we've run a little bit long, but uh, we've got time for questions. Great. Th thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing the, the slideshow uh, so we can see each other. If you want to turn on your cameras, feel free. And we don't have any questions piled up except for one, which is, are we, are we recording this presentation? Yes, we are. And we'll find a way to make it available um, to everyone on the call. And so let's just open it up. Uh, to any questions people have. And we are going to, well, we have about seven minutes. So uh, any questions, comments? So, so I've got one for, um, for Forrest. Um, 
which is basically um, what what's the single most important thing you did as um, regional biologist that you think has made the biggest difference um, for wild brook trout in the region? Probably the, uh, the more restrictive regulations. Uh, we were able to go over uh, all data which showed the potential growth potential of the waters back before they were heavily fished. And then we set the regulations according to what they used to produce in, in terms of sizes. So if they used to be able to grow big fish, there's no reason why they couldn't do it anymore. So uh, we would set high length limits and then let the fish grow to that size before they were vulnerable to, to harvest. So, and and uh, that and, and the slot limits, I think have worked out really well. And not, not to mention also that the, you ceased stocking Moose Lake McGonick, which I think made a huge difference. I, I, yeah, we, yeah, we ceased uh, uh, stocking a lot of waters when uh, uh, when the harvest uh, declined. The fishing didn't decline, but the harvest declined. And even if there was marginal marginal habitat for reproduction, it was adequate once the, a, a large number of, water, of, uh, of fish uh, weren't harvested. Okay. A quick question for Forrest and Jeff, <clears throat> Dan Shedd here. Um, there seems to be a lot of conversation around the fact that New Hampshire uh, takes a, a more liberal approach to, um, to management than does Maine. And I'm just wondering how broad is the gap, the conservation gap between fisheries management in New Hampshire and fisheries management in Maine? The uh, New Hampshire fishery is almost, especially the pond and uh, lake fisheries are almost stocked and, and, and they do stock very heavily. So, uh, so it's more of a put and take fishery than ours. Ours is a put, grow and, and, re and reproduction focus. And that, uh, it doesn't allow us to harvest as many fish, but, uh, uh, but the majority of the anglers seem to appreciate that they will have a chance at a wild fish, even if it may not have been put in yesterday. So. We share the, the uh, watersheds, uh, in many cases are shared between the states. And it seems that as the fish migrate, um, they're exposed to uh, uh, greater uh, peril when they cross state lines and it would seem to be nice if we could get a little bit of sort of regional solidarity as regards to uh, fishery conservation. Yeah, you, you, you may be aware a, a few years back, um, Forrest showed the telemetry work from the Rapid River, but there was a very similar study uh, done on the McGalloway um, and then New Hampshire, uh, and a very good biologist over in New Hampshire, uh, Diane Timmons, did a similar did a similar study on the um, the Diamond River, so those are the th kind of the three tributaries that that come into uh, Umbagog Lake, all support very similar brook trout populations. There's some real differences between them, as, as anybody who's fished all three know. Um, but what was interesting was one on the McGalloway system. Um, you've got McGalloway River fish that spend the winter in Umbagog Lake in New Hampshire. You've got Diamond River fish that drop downstream into the McGalloway and go up the McGalloway for thermal refuge in the summer. It's really one population of fish in that system straddling the border. Interestingly, the Rapid River fish, other than in Umbagog Lake in the winter, don't ever seem to mingle with those two populations in the Diamond and the McGalloway, although the Diamond and the McGalloway seem to have to um, And it, it's, it's just a challenge managing across the state border. I think the, the agencies have different objectives. Um, you know, there was a, a, a significant push to open a, a, a big chunk of the lower McGalloway to, um, to uh, hornpout fishing with live bait was, was the rationale. And I can't remember the details. I remember testifying uh, on, in, in the New Hampshire hearing. Um, I can't remember how they worked that out, but they essentially came up with a seasonal restriction. They did allow that, um, but they allowed it only at times when the adult brook trout are most likely not in that habitat. But certainly, it's not an ideal situation from the perspective of trout advocates in either state. Uh, but but that wasn't a, a, hard for me to imagine Maine having made that decision. But um, you know that that was the way New Hampshire went. It's, it's one pretty clear example that's in this region. 
Great. So we're, we're essentially out of time because we, we wanted to make sure we ended on time. Uh, but I, uh, Jeff and uh, Forrest, can we send your emails to participants if they have any follow-on questions or comments? Sure. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Great. So uh, I, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you, especially uh, Jeff and Forrest. Great presentation. Uh, exactly what we need to know in the face of the, some of the challenges that are in front of us. And Charles, thanks for pulling this together. Sure. And uh, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, love to have you with us. And uh, feel free, we have another couple seminars coming or webinars coming up that we'll probably notify you about as well. Thanks so much, everyone.